Uh, I've been just really covering just some of the uh, foundations, some of the, the principles. Some would say the elementary aspects of Pentecost, but uh, the elementary aspects of Pentecost are the most revelatory, the most powerful thing that we have, this revelation. And I would encourage you uh, in your devotion uh, throughout the year that you you frequent those topics. You frequent the core of who we are and what we believe uh, because, you know, it's wonderful when a preacher preaches, you know, core doctrines to you. But uh, I've learned at least what has worked to my advantage is to get that revelation myself. I love to hear and get revelation from the preach word of God. But in personal study, in personal time, in personal prayer, some of the most uh, revelatory things, not that they're uh, maybe revelatory to someone else, but God spoke to me in the way I needed to be spoken to to understand it. And that's what's important. If you could understand it however you need to understand it, that when you are teaching or talking or witnessing to somebody, you can convey it with ease, with excellence, with persuasion, because people can read whether you really believe in something. I don't know if you ever had a salesperson try to sell you something, and you just knew they weren't convinced of their product. Uh, I remember one time a salesman came to our house about a year or two ago, um, and uh, they were selling some air purifier thing, um, and he wouldn't talk about the price point, but I, I saw in his little handout, it was like, thousands of dollars for this air purification system and uh he's like he he doesn't have revelation of what's in my bank account uh so i ain't gonna buy it but he's he's you know he's pushing i'm trying to be kind and i usually because i'm just kind of forthright and just say no i don't want to get out of here but i was just i could just tell this guy's had a bad day and i'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt and uh anyways when uh when he turned that thing on my room uh our living room it started smelling like cigarettes and uh, I don't know what was going on with his purification system. It wasn't working for his car smoking or something. Uh, but, like, both of us just looked at each other. I'm like, bro, this isn't working. My, my house smells like cigarettes right now. And uh, it, just, it just sunk after that. He had no uh, persuasion to try to convince me of something. And so you got to have something inside of you that's absolutely persuaded and convinced that whatever comes your way, you could stand on your own two feet because underneath you is a firm foundation. It is an anchor. And so that's what we're trying to do is go over some important principles uh, that we believe, some basics, and uh, but don't overlook them as if they're so basic, rudiment, uh, elementary stuff that they uh, I'm too mature for it and I need to move on. But we are going to focus here. I don't know if we'll finish the lesson today. Um, so if we don't bring that handout back next week, but I'll probably just print them out again anyways because I know the creatures of habit in the room here. So God bless America. We're going to talk about belief of one God, belief of one God and creation the Holy Ghost talking about this same subject matter. But Matthew sixteen thirteen through 17, Jesus comes into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he's talking to his disciples, and he has this candid conversation, and he poses this question to them, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they begin to answer his question. Some people believe, Jesus, that you're John the Baptist. Some believe you're Elias. Some believe you're Jeremiah. Some believe that you're one of the prophets. And Jesus says to them, okay, you've told me what people believe about me, others, but I want to know who do you think, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, he speaks up as he does so very often. And he says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You are the son, the incarnation, the manifestation of the living God. And Jesus responds to him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And so we see here that Jesus wanted the disciples to understand that there are various beliefs of who Jesus is. And it's no different today. We live in a world where there are various beliefs of who Jesus is. And Jesus wanted, uh, as he's conveying this to the disciples, he wanted to know their beliefs as they began to expound others' beliefs. And the truth is that there is a blessing in having the right belief of who God is. 
If we can know who God is, there's a blessing that comes with it. That was the response to Simon Peter after he made his declaration of who Jesus was. And Jesus said, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. When we look into the Old Testament, there is many important uh, scriptures that we base the, the, the rest of the Bible on because it's line upon line, precept upon precept, as the Bible says in the book of Isaiah 28, 9 through 11. As we build any doctrine, it's always a line upon line. But what we see here in Deuteronomy 6, 4, this is an important verse for it is the foundation of the Jewish faith. It is the command that God gives to his people. And the command is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. This is the foundational belief of who God is. Whatever someone may believe and speak about God, this is the foundation of who God is. And we are to hear it. And we are to listen to it. That word here in Deuteronomy 6.4 is beyond just the audible uh, registration going through your ear. It is that you are to uh, respond to it. You are to believe it. You are to obey it. And so no matter what scripture you and I or any other person is reading, that individual must arrive at the conclusion that God is one. No matter what scripture is presented, because there are scriptures that you can read and you can be easily confused. You can scratch your head. You can be puzzled. But look back to the building block of our faith. Look back to the foundation of our faith. And that is there is one God. This Lord, this God is absolutely one. It is what is known in the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith, the Shema. This is the declaration of what every Jew believes, what they pray daily, what they have posted on their doors. If you were to read through the following verses after Deuteronomy 6, it begins to expound on what we are to do with this revelation. Not just to hear it for ourselves, but to speak about it in our house, to teach our children about it from the opening of the day to the closing of the day, from within the house to without the house. As you exit it, you see on your doorposts this one God revelation. As you return back into your house, you return to this one God revelation. So we, all, we must start with a one God revelation. In whatever scripture we read, we must return with a one God revelation. That is how they lived their life day to day in their house. They started it with one God. They returned to one God. Mark 12, 29 through 31, Jesus is speaking here when he has posed the question of what is the most important commandment of all. And he says, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, there's no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus, in the New Testament, said the belief of one God and complete devotion to that one God is the most important command. It's not an option. It's the most important command in the Bible. So if for some reason the Old Testament isn't enough for you, for some reason a revelation from God to Moses, the Ten Commandments, those tablets, if that wasn't enough, Jesus steps onto the scene and he goes, I just want to reiterate, I want to verify, I want you to know this is the most important command of all. So the question we ask here, is it a big deal? Is this doctrine, this belief of one God and who he is, is it a big deal or not? So let us read through the scriptures here. First John 4, 3 says, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, even now already is it in the world. And if it was prevalent 2,000 years ago, You better believe it is currently in our day today running rampant. 
So the point is that an incorrect view can mean we are not of God and could end up being the same spirit as the Antichrist. Now, no one intentionally says, you know, I want to believe the wrong thing and I want to have the spirit of Antichrist upon me. There is nobody that is professing that, that is, you know, hoping that. But the, the point is not that that person is possessed or the Antichrist, but that their influence is leading that which is away or opposes Christ. What Christ has already set in motion, that the most important commandment is one God. And so we must be very careful when we read a scripture like this, what do we do when we come uh, uh, face to face with the ideology, the doctrine, the belief system of God? John eight twenty four, Jesus says, I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Once more, an incorrect view has consequences. It can leave us dead in our sins. Not only can an incorrect view have you basically hosting a wrong spirit, it can leave you in your sins if we have the wrong view of who Jesus is. Now, this is a topic of controversy. Paul said it to Timothy as he's given instruction in chapter 3, verse 16. He says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So you and I, we, we mustn't, we should not be surprised when people get emotional or divisive surrounding this topic. Because if you are talking to somebody that is of faith, uh, and, and you start talking about the identity of God, and it differs from them, it is a personal subject matter with them because this is the God that they're praying to. This is the belief of the God that saved them, that's working in their life. And then they talk to someone else that begins to state something differently. Is it any wonder that somebody can get offended? Somebody can get agitated. Somebody can get their feathers ruffled. And so when we are witnessing or talking to somebody, we do have to keep that in mind that this is a sensitive subject matter. Not that we stray away from it, but if we're going to venture into it or if it's going to open up to us, we must have that in our mind and ask that God would grace our speech with salt, that we would be very careful, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, speaking the truth in love. And so second, uh, or yeah, second Corinthians 11, three, it's not difficult to understand. Doesn't mean that everybody understands, but it's not difficult to understand. But I fear less by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Your flesh, the devil, wants you to think this is too complex to understand. If our flesh, our carnal nature, or if the adversary can persuade us that this is too complex to understand, he can keep us away from access to life eternal. Because Jesus says, without the revelation of who he is, we can be remaining in our sins. And so is it any wonder that the devil wants to keep us worlds apart from that revelation? Because in that revelation is forgiveness of sins. In that revelation is our hope eternal. And so it is a ploy of the adversary to get us to feel like there's just no way I can get it. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, he says, To it that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's committed to us the world a word of reconciliation. So God, Father. Paul was speaking here, and he says that God was in Christ. God was fully in the physical body of Jesus on earth. So the apostles go through great length to uh, to try to help the church understand who God is because they understand the ramifications of an incorrect view because they were there with Jesus. They heard Jesus. They've been commissioned by Jesus. And so he's telling them that God was in Christ fully, completely, totally in the physical body of Jesus on earth. Matthew 1, 21 through 23, as the angel is speaking 
uh, when, when we were reading the opening of Mary and Joseph's life and, and, and all of a sudden this revelation is going forth. He says that she's going to bring forth a son, talking about Mary, and the child. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. A sidebar there, he's quoting from Isaiah 7.14. He's giving the revelation. The angel is bringing the understanding of what is about to occur here. And Jesus, uh, uh, the most basic, simplistic definition of what Jesus means is God, my salvation. When you say Jesus, you are saying God, you are saying Jehovah, one God, Old Testament saves me, is salvation. That is who he is. Jesus can forgive sins only because he was God with us. That is what Emmanuel uh, explains this son. The Emmanuel is an understanding that this son is God with us. But this God with us has a name. And that name proclaims that this God saves. And so now... It's, it's a whole other uh, uh, level of amazing, of one, the virgin birth, but all of a sudden not only am I going to be a virgin that gives child, the child that I am carrying is more than just man, more than person. It is deity that I am giving birth to, fully God and fully man, as we talked about this past Wednesday. Isaiah 9, 6 is one of my favorite verses to help my naive little mind, my finite mind, understands something complex about God, though it's not too complex because God wants us to understand it. There is a simplicity that is in Christ. And it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so, What's going on here is that this is a prophecy of the birth of Jesus. We have just read over 400 years prior to Jesus, and there is a proclamation of something that is going to occur, that he is born a child who is a son, but he is the mighty God. And this child that is a son that is born is not only the mighty God, he is the everlasting father. This is an important bedrock verse that you have to have in your in your handbag. You have to have in your heart, in your mind, because it's so amazingly, it's kind of almost like that summarization as we talked about Acts 238 for a number of weeks, how it summarizes so much in one verse. Every now and again, you come across a verse, and every verse is inspired of God, but there's a verse that just has so much understanding and expounding packed into a tiny package. And here it says this tiny package is son, this child that is born, is more than a son, more than a child. It is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Uh, A very basic way that I can explain it, just using myself as a reference, is that I am a son, I am a husband, and I am a father. But that does not make me three persons. It does not make me three distinct people. And basically, I, you know, I am one and my name. I have one name. I am one person and I have one name. That is Mark. Son, husband, father. Those are roles or attributes, modes in which I operate and interact with person depending upon the context of the moment and the person that I am dealing with in the season of life. But uh, as silly as it may sound is that I don't kiss my mom the same way I kiss my wife, and we all should say thank God for that. When I interact with my mother, it is as... You know, uh, if, if, if I interact with my mom, it's as a son. When I interact with my wife, it is as a husband. But both know 
me by my name, Mark. And so it is with God in Scripture, depending on the circumstance of what we are reading, God is interacting with people in one way or another. But it is not a plurality of deity, as we have read the bedrock understanding of this deity is that he is one. And whatever we read, when, once we, we close that book and walk and come across any other scripture, any other person, when we return, the conclusion may, must be the same as the foundation, what we started off with, that this is the most important command. John 14, 6 through 10 is another moment in the New Testament where Jesus tries to help some people understand some things about himself, about God. Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip replies to Jesus, says, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. Jesus replies back to him, haven't I been with you so long that you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Why are you then saying, show us the Father? Don't you believe not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Remember 2 Corinthians five nineteen, to wit that God was in Christ. And so Paul had a revelation, though he wasn't even a part of this conversation with the original apostles that God was in Christ. And he says, the words that I speak, it's the Father that dwells in me. This verse expounds what we just read in Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus, this son, this child, is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Jesus is helping his disciples to understand Isaiah 9, 6. He says, yes, I might be a son. Yes, I might be the Christ. I might be your Messiah. I might be your teacher. But I'm more than that. This son that is talking to you, this teacher that is talking to you, it's the father that dwells inside of me. That's why when you look at me, you are looking at the father because you look past the veil, you will see the presence of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And so Jesus was the physical manifested presence of the Father on earth or the Son of God. It is the incarnation of God. It is the manifestation of God. This question can surface to a mind is that is Jesus a part of God or all of God? Paul speaks here to the church in Colossians 2, 9 and 10. And he's speaking about Jesus. He says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Godhead means the divinity of God, his divine nature. And so in the body of Jesus was the absolute, complete divinity and divine nature of God, meaning that Jesus is not part of God, but all of God. And it was it was uh, an amazing moment on uh, on Wednesday night as Pastor Jared was teaching. And uh, again, I've never come across doctrine where I get bored. I love listening to the doctrine. I love teaching the doctrine because it is one of the most exciting and most fascinating things when it it begins to illuminate the mind and speak to you. And he said something that I've never heard explained before, at least for me. And if I heard explained before, I never caught it. But when he, he mentioned there's three times that Paul repeats himself in one verse, uh, he repeats a point or a concept about Jesus, about God. And he says it in verse 9, and you could circle these three if you would like, and it is the word all, fullness, and Godhead. Three times in this short verse, he emphasizes the totality of God in the body 
of Jesus Christ. He could have just said Jesus is God. But he says the Godhead, which is the complete divinity of God. And that would have been enough that the Godhead is in Christ. But he didn't just say the Godhead. He said the fullness of the Godhead. Basically, all of God, all of God was in him. And then he just put the cherry on top with all. Again, all of God, all of him was in Christ Jesus. And it is an amazing, when he said that, man, the Spirit of God came over. I was so excited, you know, and, and the presence of God was here. Why? Because this is a powerful revelation to realize who Jesus is when you're praying to him, when you're talking about him, when you're worshiping him, when you're talking to him, that you're not talking to a part of God or a chain of command. You are talking to God. John 10, 31 through 33, the Jews even pick up stones to throw at Jesus and kill him. And Jesus asks this question, though he knows the answer. He says, I've done a lot of good works that I showed you from my father. Which of those works are you going to stone me for? And the Jews answered him, not for a good work we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy we're going to stone you, because you being a man make yourself God. The Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus because he claimed to be God. The Pharisees understood. Why? Because that is what they paraded with, is this Deuteronomy 6.4. One God. One God. They had that on their apparel. One God. They had it on the post of their home. One God. They had it read in the synagogue. One God. It was ingrained in their mind. And Jesus, when he began to talk about God, talk about himself, they understood what he was saying, and they immediately picked up rocks to kill him because they did not believe who he claimed to be. He claimed to be God, but the Pharisees did not believe who he claimed to be. Zechariah 14, 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. This is a prophecy about the millennial reign, 1,000 years of Jesus' reign of peace. Basically saying, well, you guys have seen how uh, it's worked out for you to have you know, your elections and, and uh, you, your governments on earth, but just give me a shot for a 1,000 years and I'll let you see what a good governor, a prince of peace, runs his government like. And so this is a prophecy about what is to come. It states that the Lord, Jehovah Father, will be the king and is one and has one name. Again, Zechariah 14, 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And if you're reading in the King James, King James is one of those translations and amplify that makes uh, emphatic effort to show when the name of God is being used and will put in all capital letters, you know, that sacred name of God. And so this says that Jehovah, that one Father God, will be king over the, all the earth, one Lord, his name one. But in the New Testament, it reveals the Lord, Jehovah, Father, is Jesus in the millennial reign. Look at Revelation nineteen sixteen and Revelation 20 and verse 4. It says that Jesus has on his vesture, his thigh, a name that is written, King of kings, Lord of lords, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Jesus is the revelation of God. He is the revelation of salvation. Isaiah 45, 22 and 23, reading in the word of the Lord, says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. I am God, there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. God's saying, what I'm about to say, I'm not taking it back. He says that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Once more, Lord Jehovah Father is speaking here of who he is and that there is none next to him, none beside him, and to him and him alone will every knee bow and every tongue confess. And so Paul in the New Testament with revelation and understanding speaks to the church and he quotes it. He says, wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name 
that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, deity, the supreme being in authority. Lord uh, in, in the Greek is the dynamic equivalent of Lord in the Old Testament, Jehovah. He's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting that Lord, what he said. And he says, Jesus is the only God, and there is none else. Jesus is the name of God that will bring all to their knees. Jesus Christ is Lord. That was the opening sermon of Peter in Acts 2.36. He says, I want everyone to, to understand. He goes, this same Jesus that you have crucified, God hath made him both Lord and Christ. He's not a, just a guy on the street. He's not just a teacher. He is Lord and Christ. He is Savior, the Messiah, but he is deity. He is God. And when the Jews heard that, that's when conviction got inside of them. They were pricked in their heart. And so Jesus Christ is Lord. That understanding does not undermine another person in a Godhead, but it gives glory and lifts up the one true living God. And that's why when you see in the book of Acts, they, they emphatically state time and time again the power of the name of Jesus Acts 4.12 in your handout there says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so the name of Jesus is all-powerful because he's the Almighty. Revelation 1.8 states that. Jesus speaks. He says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, says the Lord which was and is and is to come the Almighty. Not some mighty, not one of the mighties. He is almighty. Jesus Christ is almighty God. First John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And as we stated, circling back in the beginning of, of the Scriptures we went over in the handout today, Deuteronomy 6.4 is the bedrock of the monotheistic faith. That what God gave his, as he began to reveal himself to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and then to Moses, as Moses began to pen and write these things. And Jesus reemphasized when asked the question, what's the most important commandment of all? He quotes in Mark 12, 29 through 31. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And so John, the apostle, the beloved, the one that was so intimately close to Jesus Christ, he had this understanding he says that no matter what you face, what you think, what you read, what you hear, the conclusion is one. The conclusion must always be one. The danger is to read about three and end up with three in your mind. But the Bible says there is the Father, there is the Word, there is the Spirit, but these three are one. Just like the Jews, they start out their day walking out of the house on their doorpost, one God. And whatever they faced when they came back, they came back to the same conclusion. There is one God. So let's read a couple of verses here. We got about 10 more minutes, maybe nine or eight. James 2.14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man says he has faith and not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked, destitute of daily food, one you say to him, depart in peace, be warm, filled, but you don't give the things that are needful to the body. What does it benefit? What does it profit them? Even so it is with faith. If it has not works, it's dead being alone. Yea, a man can say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. And then he comes to this point here. It's awesome that he would use this in illustrating faith. He says, you believe there is one God, you do well. If you believe this one God, Revelation, you do well. Because the devils also believe it and tremble. And so 
he says, will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? This faith works. This belief works. Satan knows there is only one God because heaven was his former place of residence before he got kicked out. In Luke 10, 8, Jesus said, look, I, I, I watched Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And that's why every time Jesus showed up, they knew who he was. And what did the devils cry out? We know who you are, the Holy One. One. They still knew that there is one God. There is one God who is holy. And so what's so powerful here is that this holy God, you know, the, 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 the devil said in Mark one twenty four, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? You've come to destroy us. We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And the point is we have a, re- a revelation that shakes all of hell. Hell cannot stand before a person that believes in one God and knows the mighty name of the almighty God, Jesus means Jehovah God, my salvation. The devil is scared of a Jesus name, praying man, woman of God that prays with authority, that prays with revelation and prays with persuasion. There is revival in one God that no devil in hell can stop. But if the devil can cause you to be basically buckle and not believe or to not be persuaded of who Jesus is and the power. That's why the disciples time and time again, they obeyed. They didn't disobey Jesus when Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, he said, you know, baptize everyone in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. But you never read anyone being baptized in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Ghost. All throughout the original church in the book of Acts, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. They weren't rebelling against Jesus. They weren't disobeying Jesus. They understood who Jesus was. Because in what we read in Matthew 16, when Peter and Jesus and the disciples were talking, who do men say that I am? He said who Jesus was. And he says, that's a revelation. Blessed are thou. And so when Peter stood up and preached on that day of Pentecost, he unequivocally declared who Jesus was. And the Holy Ghost was poured out in a mighty fashion. Matthew 13, 54 through 50. I got to hurry. We only got five more minutes here. And we're reading about Jesus when he comes into his own country. And he's teaching in the synagogue. And people begin to ask, what in the world? How is he doing all of this? In verse 55, it says, isn't this, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother Mary? We know his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Jesus. We know his sisters. They're, aren't they all with us here? And how can he do all these things? And Jesus said, a prophet's not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Revival was quenched because they did not believe who he was. All they saw was his humanity rather than his divinity. Even after a mass healing spree, when you read Matthew 8, Matthew 9, Matthew 12, Jesus is going out healing everybody. And they're puzzled in their mind, how is he doing all this as a man? He's just a man. But Jesus, he says, that's your problem. You just think this this is what you think I am. But I'm more than what you think I am. I am that I am. That's what he said to his detractors, the Pharisees, who had one God revelation that they thought they understood. But there's the revelation standing in front of him. And he says, look, I am that I am. The same God that spoke into the bush or through the bush to Moses was the same God standing in front of him saying, I am that I am. There is one God. God and they could not get it through their mind that God could be manifest in the flesh. Luke 5 17 through 26. I can't read all of it, but Jesus forgives sins. In verse 21, they say, Who can forgive sins but God alone? And he says in verse 24, So you know, 
So you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he begins to heal. And in verse 25, that they says they begin to glorify God. The power of God was present to heal. You know why? The, it's what it says when you read those verses. The power of God was present to heal him, but none of them were healed at the moment because they didn't believe who he was. But when some people came in from the outside that believed who he was, he healed them and he forgave them. And so the power of God was present to heal him. Why? Because Jesus is God. Matthew one twenty one. he is Emmanuel, God with us. That's why God is present to heal them. And so God with us. No one at that point was being healed because they did not believe who he was. Having an incorrect view leaves you incapacitated. But the one who was incapacitated had the correct view, and he got up, and he walked, and he glorified God. God alone forgives sins, and that's just what Jesus did. And now knowing from the Scripture what we know about the power of the belief of this one God, it says in Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It, God, you know, if, if you've heard it, if you've stated it, that God's just a mystery, you'll never understand. You just got to, you know, he's just a mystery. No, First Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he explains what that is. God was manifest in the flesh. He preached among Gentiles. He was received, he was seen of angels, received on up into glory. That is the mystery that has been revealed to us in what we read in Colossians 1.27. It says that God makes known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. It doesn't say God has hidden for all ages for the end of time that you'll never understand who he is. But he's let us Gentiles that were not even part of that covenant people. And he says, I'll let you know. If there's a group that doesn't want to know and refuses to understand this revelation, I'll let you have this revelation. That we can have Jesus, the mighty God in Christ, this revelation, the hope of glory. So in you is the power of that one God. The devils believe and tremble. Every knee bows. Every tongue confesses. Every sin is remitted. Every sickness surrenders. Amen. Let's, let's stand and pray as we're dismissed. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this revelation. Lord, as we talked about, just like Jesus and the disciples talked, there are various beliefs of who people think you are, Jesus. But there is a blessing in understanding who you are. Not that a finite mortal man can understand everything about God, but Lord, there are things you want us to understand about you, that you are one, that you are love, that you are gracious, that you are merciful, that you are compassionate, that you are quick to forgive, that you are slow to anger. God, there's things you want us to know that have been mysteries to others, but God, there is a people that you want to reveal to. Help us, Lord, to have an appreciation of that revelation in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll reconvene up here in about 15 minutes.